So what we're going to talk about here is some of the most important metrics that you should utilize if you don't do so yet in training, in endurance training specifically, for increasing health and fitness, especially with the aim to increase health span and lifespan. So what are those metrics you want to look at from an endurance training point of view? One overarching one is body composition, specifically body fat, visceral body fat. The fat that surrounds the organs is something you're specifically interested in, but also obviously overall BMI, body mass index, overall body fat, right? We have a meta-analysis on the most accurate body composition analyzing tools. And there's actually one out there that costs just a little bit more than 200 bucks and shows the same accuracy as a DEXA scan or bot pod. We had deployed these devices in several Olympic federations in elite sports with great success because the data always comes back within a percent or one and a half percent of a more expensive DEXA scan or bot pod analysis. And we're going to link that device into the show notes here into the article. So that is one thing that's important. The other thing we're going to talk about, which is linked, it's actually more linked to body composition than you might think, is training at the right training intensity. We're going to talk about metabolic flexibility, basically meaning the ability of the body to use fat and or carbohydrates and to switch between those two as a fuel. We're talking about maximum fat oxidation rate, training at maximum fat combustion rate, fat oxidation rate, fat mix zone. And we're talking, of course, about aerobic fitness, VO2 max, the single most important metric maybe for longevity at health span and lifespan. How to assess it, how to train for it, and how to do so without spending a fortune on lab equipment and without spending several hours in a human performance lab and therefore very limited accessibility. So let's have a look how these metrics are actually interconnected. Okay, so one important question we should ask ourselves is, are we, are our clients exercising at the most efficient training intensity in contrast to the goals, obviously, what they try to achieve? So there's one training intensity. The popular name for it might be zone two training. However, there's no definition, actually. There's been a scientific paper arguing or moaning about the fact that there's no scientific definition of what zone two means or how it's determined exactly, right? The better way to look at it is the most efficient training intensity, which actually Zone True was trying to approximate, so to speak, which is the intensity at which the body burns the most amount of fat, meaning the most amount of the calorie is derived from fat oxidation. So if you look at a graph like this, where you plot the intensity, the exercise intensity on the x-axis, so low intensity rest on the very left, high intensity on the very right. The fat combustion rate looks something like this. So it first increases with exercise intensity, fat combustion rate goes up, then it reaches a maximum, a plateau, an apex, and then it decreases to zero. So at some high intense, harder, higher exercise intensity, it decreases to zero, or almost zero to be precise. Carbohydrate combustion rate, on the other hand, shows this curve linear or exponential behavior where it's increasing slowly at the beginning and then rapidly to, to, to speak at higher intensities. So training at fat, at a high fat combustion rate, basically means there's an, a relatively speaking higher oxygen uptake. So fatty acid need additional oxygen to be prepared or be combusted, simplified speaking, prepared for the metabolism, be used in the metabolism. So at fat max, relatively speaking, the oxygen uptake is higher, which means there's a higher aerobic stimulus. There's a higher training stimulus on the aerobic system, right? Which therefore is another reason why training at fat max is one of the most important training intensity because it's the most efficient one to increase the automax. We're going to talk about there's other ways how to increase the automax, but one major important one is training at this fat max. Okay. So already two reasons why you want to know this one here. Then there's a carbohydrate combustion and the Looking at both these graphs tells you how well the, the body of the athlete, how well the metabolism can shift between fat combustion rate and carbohydrate combustion rate. And one marker many people look at is actually this crossing point where 50% of the energy comes from fat and 50% of the energy comes from carbohydrate and at which intensity that occurs, okay? So 
Metabolic flexibility, this is what we're looking at here. Another major metric you want to monitor, you want to assess, you want to measure precisely in your clients. And then of course, the big one here is the blue one, is the VO2 max. The ability of the body of the athlete of the client to utilize oxygen for energy delivery. The higher that number is, the better. Now, the issue is that one, this is not static. These graphs will look different for every client at every given point in time, given that there are some kinds of development because of training adaptation or de-adaptation. So the VO2 max can be at any other intensity, right? It can be higher or lower. And it can change by training. And it changes by training relatively quickly. Within a few weeks, you can see changes of 5 or 10%. Now, the problem is, yes, I know VO2 max is estimated by many variables, right? Almost every smartwatch now reads the VO2 max value to you. But scientific research tells us that the numbers you see here are good enough, are precise enough to distinguish between a VO2 max of 40 versus 50 or 60. But this is, these are not the differences you're looking for when you coach athletes or clients, people who want to increase VO2 max. You're looking at much, much smaller changes. You're looking at people who want to or can effectively increase their VO2 max from 28 to 31 or from 37 to 40 in this range, and a variable is not precise enough to detect that. In order to do that, you would normally need some metabolic card, some lab device, and we are going to show you in a second how you can do it with the same precision, but much, much more inexpensive. So VO2 max is quite different. It changes by training. And the same goes for this fat curve. So fat combustion curve doesn't always have to look like this. You could also have a client where the fat combustion curve looks like this, or where it looks like this. So basically the intensity at which fat makes occur, so therefore the most efficient training intensity can be quite different, even as a percentage or specifically, especially as a percentage of VO2 max or heart rate max, okay? So these are the metrics you want to look at combined with the body compositions. You want to look at to monitor the progress of your clients. You want to look at these metrics to understand what is the status quo, how good is the VO2 max really? How much do I need to improve it? How does it compare to peers is the same age, same gender, right? Is it high or is it low? Is there a big room for improvement, right? This is what you need to know. And you need to know that with a high precision. And then you want to know fat max, metabolic flexibility, all these things along the body composition to understand how can I prescribe the best training. So these are the tools, the most important pillars, most important metrics for training for longevity and health span. Now, the issue is again, how do you get VO2 max with variables? Not precisely enough. How do you get fat max? How do you get fat combustion curve, metabolic flexibility? If you don't own a human performance lab, if you are not owning a university lab, if you didn't have the spare 20, 25K in cash to buy a metabolic card, then likely you don't. So what I'm trying to say is that accessibility for that is pretty poor. But let me show you now that there's another way to do that. I'm going to show you a way how you can use a very, very inexpensive way to get all these metrics in a fraction of the time. Because normally to get fat combustion, carbohydrate combustion, you would need to spend a test and you do need to do an incremental test, which takes, you know, half an hour-ish with like increments of five, six, seven minutes. So, and then you need to have a rest and you do a REM test for view 2 max, so you spend two, three hours in the laboratory, right? Which of course also costs time and costs money. So there's a better way to do it. I'm going to show you right now. So here's how you can deliver all these important metrics and all these important insights to your clients. Here's how you can prescribe most efficient endurance training to increase VO2 max and increase metabolic flexibility. One thing I already mentioned is I'm going to give you the device and the science behind it, which you can use to have a really accurate and reliable assessment of body composition. And therefore you can include that no brainer, pretty straightforward. For the other stuff, metabolic flexibility, fat max, VO2 max, how are you gonna do that? The key to do that in a non-expensive way yet super reliable and as accurate as a lab grade metabolic card lies in a device like this. A simple handheld lactate meter, which you can buy for 200, 300 bucks, okay? I'm not selling these devices. I don't get any from it. Just telling you that lactate, so to speak, or even names of cytochrome of metabolism, holds the key to assess metrics like fat max and VO2 max without the need 
of running several hours of testing and without the need of investing into an expensive metabolic heart. Let me show you why that works and how it works on a high level. So what you would do, you would do some kind of pretty conventional, I would argue, traditional incremental testing. So you have here, visualize the time on the x-axis and then four node blocks, okay? And those node blocks are relatively short. So they can just be like three minutes each, each load. So the total um, time or the net time uh, will only be 12 minutes. You might have a short break in between uh, to take lactate samples, especially if you do it in running or walking, right? When you do it on a cycling meter, for example, you can actually take the lactate while the athlete or the client is exercising. So that would be easy. But let's assume here we do a walking or a running test. So you need to stop, let's say for 30 seconds or a minute to take the lactate. So net time, super short, super straightforward, just one test. Okay? Now, you would take the lactate samples before that, and I'm going to explain how this works, and after each step, okay? And then at the end, you see the maximum, if you take several data samples until you see the peak, so you get a total of like six, seven, eight lactate samples, and that's it. The whole thing can be done within approximately 20 minutes. The intensity starts so low that you would not actually need to warm up. You can do a warm up, it's optional, but you don't have to, okay? You can start with such a low intensity that the first block is so easy, the first two blocks of exercise are good enough for a warm up. No need for additional warm up if you want to do it this way, okay? So now you may ask, okay, but wait a second, how is it possible or why is it even possible to use lactate and get something like a VO2? And how does that relate to the fat combustion? How, how can you do that? Okay, let me explain. Lactate is a metabolite that comes out of a process that's called glycolysis. So glycolysis is several steps, anaerobic metabolism, no oxygen uptake involved, where basically glucose or glycogen is broken down or broken up, so to speak, into lactate. And what is known, what is well established in science, is basically that the only way how a cell, how an athlete, how a client, how an organism can produce lactate is by breaking those glucose. And every time you want to use glucose or glycogen as a fuel, it becomes lactate, approximately 98%. So let's forget about the last 2%. So almost all the glucose, whenever you want to use glucose or glycogen as fuel, it becomes lactate, right? So what I'm saying is there's a proportional relationship between the breakdown or utilization of glucose and glycogen and how much lactate is produced. Now, this is concentration, what you measure. This is not production. But what we are actually able to do, we are able to decipher, to disclose the production rate. So lactate production per time, per minute, per second, where you want to choose, you know, we choose minutes, okay? That actually creates the lactate concentrations that you can measure. So we can go from the concentration back to the actual production. And now think about it, that opens up a whole new level because if you know the rate of lactate production, then you know, again, because of what I just explained, it's proportional to glucose or glycogen combustion, then you know how much glucose somebody combusted. Okay, now it gets interesting because we know the workload. We know the running speed, walking speed, power up on elliptical, on a rowing ergometer, whatsoever. So if we know the workload, we know the total energy demand. And if we now deduct the amount of energy that comes that is derived, that is delivered through glycolysis, through breakdown of glucose, then we know that the remaining is fat combustion. So this is how we easily get the fat combustion rates. And then there's another aspect to it. We now know that we can use lactate to get glucose and carbohydrate combustions, and therefore we can get fat combustion. Then there's another aspect to it, which is if you would look at the oxygen uptake, right? Oxygen uptake doing something like this would basically show uh, the kinetics like this one, right? And then at the end you reach, so to speak, VO2 max, and then it's going down, okay? So that's the proxima VO2 would look like. How does that relate to lactate? So how do we get the VO2 max? This lab level accuracy I'm going to show you. This is because whenever the body, the cell, breaks down glycogen and glucose and produces lactate, there comes an ATP production, there comes an energy production with it. And that's also proportional. So once we know the lactate production rate, we know also how much energy is derived from glycolysis. And then the same thing applies if we know the total energy demand because we know the workload, then all the remaining energy that's not coming from anaerobic metabolism has to come from aerobic metabolism. So therefore, it is possible to very precisely get the oxygen uptake for each of those steps and therefore also get 
the maximal oxygen uptake at the end of the test. Or in other words, think about it this way. If you're coming from an exercise physiology background, or you're familiar with traditional VO2 max test, putting on a mass, attaching you know, to a metabolic heart, what is actually happening here? The athlete, the subject, is exposed to a workload that is very, very high, that leads to exhaustion in a few minutes, either as part of a REM test or as part of an all-out test. So the workload is higher than the amount of energy, the amount of power that can be delivered by the aerobic metabolism, therefore maxing out VO2, therefore VO2 keeps going up until it reaches maximum, maybe reaches a plateau, leveling off, all these kind of things, okay? Fine. So what you could argue is that the area, so to speak, below the blue curve is all the energy, it's everything that is covered by the aerobic metabolism. Okay, then there's a slow component and so on and so forth. So this here, to speak, is the O2 deficit that is covered by creatine phosphate. You can ignore that, but basically this amount here, so to speak, would be covered anaerobically by the glycolysis. By the glycolysis. So what I'm trying to tell you is that when you do a classic test with a metabolic heart, you impose a load which is higher than what the aerobic metabolism can deliver. Again, either at the REM test, at the end of the REM test, or as a single bout of exercise. And you just measure the aerobic part, and you ignore basically whatever additional energy was delivered by the glycolytic metabolism. What I'm showing you here is what you can do with lactate, is you look, so to speak, at the flip side of the very same coin you look at how much energy comes from the glycolate, from the lactate part, and then everything else at the end of the exercise has to come from oxygen uptake, and therefore you know the VO2 max. So this might sound pretty conceptual to you theoretically. In fact, this methodology is validated by peer-reviewed independent science, and it's proven that the accuracy and reliability of that methodology is as good as using a medical grade metabolic card in a human performance lab. The difference is you only need one test to get substrate utilization, fat and carbohydrates, and VO2 max instead of two separate tests, which you would normally need. And instead of needing equipment for 20, 35K, which is a lab medical grade metabolic card, you just need this 200, 300 bucks lactate analyzer. So you get more information out with the same accuracy in a short amount of time without this overhead of buying the expensive machines. So therefore, this methodology could solve the problem for you to prescribe very, very accurate and therefore efficient training intensities and training programs. Training at FatMax, we did not even talk about prescribing high intensity training, which is shown to be very efficient to elicit or to increase uh, VO2 max, right? Which you can do with that. You can also get the metabolic flexibility because you get both fat and carbohydrate combustion rate. Right? And of course you get a VO2 max. Now your links is back to what I also told you. You use this um, body composition analyzer. The whole bundle is like whatever, 500 bucks to as a lactate machine. And you're all set to do a complete metabolic assessment lab level accuracy as a fraction of the cost, a fraction of the time. Check out the article below.